So thanks for being on Stream for Vengeance. Um, let's dive right into the whole ACDC thing because um, I have to ask, how does it feel to be part of a project that has topped the charts in 18 countries plus? Well, it's, it's actually blowing my mind. I mean, you know, when we did the record, uh, you know, you know, it's going to be a good record. I mean, it's the boys and uh, strong songs and everything. And, you know, but you never know when you're when you're doing it, how it's going to be received by everybody. So it's kind of blowing me away that it's a uh, it's jumped to number one and, you know, a lot of the world and in, in a pretty short time. So, you know, uh, thank God for them. You know, they've they've actually almost saved 2020. You know, they've given a lot of people a lot of hope and and everybody's out there rocking and banging their heads. So, yay. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Well, you've, you've hung out with these guys for years. Do you think they actually have any expectations when they release a record? Or is it just like, whatever, this is what we're going to give you. If you accept it, then everyone's happy. You know, I think, you know, they go in uh, with the perception that they just want to do what's making them happy and what they do they love and, and dig. I mean, they just love doing it and recording and, and playing live for their fans. So I don't think they go in with any preconceptions, um, but you know, they're I'm sure overjoyed with the reception of this record and how happy the fans are. So, uh, you know. Well, as a diehard fan, I must really flag October 1st because that was the day we heard 10 seconds of Shot in the Dark. Right. And I'll never forget it. It's, it, it's like, it's, it's one of those moments, like, you remember where you were when ACDC launched their new record during COVID and we heard 10 seconds yeah. and it just, a shiver just went up my spine. It was just such a heartwarming thing. Yeah. yeah. Me as well. You know, it had been almost two years since we had recorded it. And, you know, you start wondering with the pandemic going on and, and the record in the can, like, you know, is it even going to see the light of day this year? Uh, so it was pretty cool to see that little glimmer of hope. And, you know, oh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> well, like, it really felt like it was real because the only thing that was leaked, and I, I not to get, like, like, digging into the weeds with this, but it was like a year ago, someone had taken a shot of Phil Rudd in Vancouver and the band's not saying, nobody's saying a thing. It's like, what's Phil doing in Vancouver? And then there was a shot of Phil and Cliff or something. So it's like the band paying attention to this gossip and like all this stuff that's getting leaked. Do they know what's happening? Uh, well, you all said they knew it was happening when this pictures got leaked, but you know, I think their intention at the time was to go in quietly into a studio and see what they've got. You know, they, they didn't know, you know, Brian was fresh back in the band, you know, after his hearing stuff. So that, you know, how's that going to work? Uh, you know, Cliff had said he, he wanted to retire. Um, you know, Phil had his problems. So, you know, putting that all together must have been a log logistic nightmare. And I think they wanted to keep it under wraps. And if it worked out, give the fans a great surprise present. Because, you know, at the end of that tour, it's kind of all up in the air. It's, you know, are they going to carry on? is there a band to carry on? So they wanted to keep it in rap. So it kind of, I think it really disappointed it that they, it got leaked, but yeah. you know, they're a huge monster band. So, you know, how, how can it not? There's paparazzi everywhere. <laughs> yeah, paparazzi. <laughs> well, to, like, like how hard is it you think for the band to be stealth and for you to be stealth? Because you have to, everything's gotta be, it's like Fort Knox. You can't say a thing. You can't like even like no poker face. Well, you know, for sure it's tough and, you know, the band all come to a city that they don't live in and, you know, they're going to be out at restaurants and wandering the streets and all that. So they're, they're going to get spotted and it's going to, going to come out, but you know, that, you know, if they're spotted the streets or restaurant that could be them doing anything up for a visit or whatever, you know, to have the, the pictures uh, outside the studio there and the balcony where it was kind of, eh. All right. <laughs> Cat's out of the bag. <laughs> right. When did you actually press the stop button on this? Like, when was it in the can officially? And how long was it sitting there for then? Well, I think that was July, August. We're in Vancouver, 2018. Uh, then Brendan and I went down to LA and mixed for about three or four weeks. And then 
they sat on it for a little bit. And then I think Brendan and Angus got together and did some more editing and uh, a couple other remix things. Um, so I'm not exactly sure when it was over, but I would guess, you know, uh, October ish of, I guess it was still 2018. That's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. What is your role though? Like what, what does the band want from you, Mike Fraser? And how, like, like how far ahead of time does that happen? Well, you know, my role is, is as an engineer. So basically I take, you know, kind of my direction from Brandon and the band, but, you know, in working with the band for so long, and this is Brandon and I's third record together. So we kind of do what we're doing, you know? So my role is, you know, get going in and capturing the sounds, making sure everything's sounding good and, and getting to tape, you know, really good. Um, and I'm always got to be ready to go because when the band's ready to record, they want to go now. There's no sort of, hey, let's, let's try one, make sure the sounds are good. No, th when they play, they want to play. They go out there, they're on fire and it's up to me to capture the fire, you know? So uh, that's kind of my role in it. And as far as pre-planning, like, you know, when I walked into the studio for the first, first time, it was probably in July, uh, I had no idea what form of the band was showing up as far as I knew. It was just going to be Angus and and it was up in the air, you know, who's playing on this. So I didn't know <laughs> what was up until I walked in and saw all these familiar faces. And it was a big, uh, big huggy love fest for the That's next awesome. half hour. <laughs> High five. That's it was awesome. great. Yeah. Um, that, the whole Brian situation, I think, disturbed the entire ACDC community. Um, how did that kind of figure itself out with this record? You know, I don't know much of that because I'm not privy to what's going on when they're not in the studio. Uh, I know Brian walked in totally raring and ready to go. Uh, lots of energy, happy, just, you know, so excited, like a, a kid to be there doing it again. So, you know, there was no, no problems at all. <laughs> Well, as a fan and listening like that, those first 10 seconds, I really felt the warmth that Mutt brought to the band on For Those About to Rock. Mm. It was, don't you, that's where it really took me back to. Do you hear that? For sure. You know, on this record, I hear a lot of sort of similarities to some of the older records. Um, <clears throat> you know, obviously the older Brian records, you know. Uh, so it was just kind of a, a neat... Uh, journey for me all the different sort of sounds you know I can you know maybe imagine that uh, maybe some of those were uh, written with Mal from back in the little older days you know because they were all bits and pieces that Mal and Angus had written over the years and and Angus had a big pile of tapes and notes and and everything from all those so um, you know Malcolm's hand was definitely in on a lot of these songs for sure. Yeah, so how was the studio mood around that? Because that is like the most, when, when he passed, I, the first thing I thought of is like, this is one of the main people that taught like generations of kids how to play the guitar. He was this rhythm guitar master, all these basic leads and everything. Like, it's like, wow, it was really, man, that was a tough day. There's been a lot of tough days, but that's that was one of them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, this one, he, you always still feel Mal in the studio, like he's sitting on your shoulder or looking over, uh, but it's more in a mel melancholy way. You know, when we did uh, the previous record, um, uh, I think it was felt a lot more because it was the first record without Mal. Uh, but, you know, all the guys are, are great family and great players. So, you know, we get into the studio and we just get to business and do what we need to do, you know? Um, and, you know, we're definitely always, you know, tipping our glass of tea or whatever to Mal because uh, he is always there. Yeah, no, absolutely. W when did you first meet ACDC then? Like, when did that topic come up? Uh, well, that was back in the 90s when they came um, and hired Bruce Fairburn to finish off Razor's Edge. They had recorded a lot of the record uh, previously with their, their brother, George and uh, they needed to do some vocals and uh, some guitar solos. So they came to Vancouver 90-ish, I forget the exact year. Um, so that was the first time I met them and uh, 
totally blown away. You know, I've always been a huge fan. So to actually have them come into our studio in Vancouver and sit down and, and watch them play was just such a thrill. Well, really, Bruce and his team, which obviously you were part of, really elevated their career. Like it, they've really kickstarted it back again. Yeah. Razor's Edge was massive. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the band had had thunderstruck, so you know that for sure launched that record. And uh, you know, when we recorded that song, I had no idea it was going to be kind of become the iconic song you know it's up there with their for those about to rock and back in black and highway to hell it's like you know it's one of their iconic songs and you had no idea it was going to do that while you're recording it you know it was a a great song but you know again you never know what the the perception of that song is going to be until it gets out there okay so you met the band during the razor's edge era so when were you introduced then to acdc what give me your bond scott kind of stories going way back well, going way back, I think as a was, fan, yeah, no, I think it was uh, maybe '78. Uh, we were going to see. It was a big Aerosmith fan. Aerosmith came to Vancouver to play, and this band called uh, ACDC was opening up for them. And you know, we hadn't heard of ACDC, and and in our day, ACDC meant you could go either way, you know, kind of thing. So, but we ended up going to see the opening band and we're just blown away. We're just like, Holy crap. Who the hell are these guys, man? This Aerosmith show is going to be great. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately I think that that was right in the middle of their, their worst sort of darkest drug induced days and the car, their concert wasn't very good. So I think we ended up leaving early, but I went straight to record store and found everything I could on, on this band ACDC. And uh, from that day, I was a huge fan. So how many times did you see Bon Scott perform live then? Well, that was probably the only time. And I didn't realize it till many years later. I thought, oh, yeah, well, you know, what tour was that? And I think it was probably the Highway to Hell tour if it was 78. Yeah, 78, 79. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got to see Bon Scott. But at the time, I didn't appreciate it because, you know, I know, know nothing about them, you know. And, and little did I know that I'd never get another chance to to witness them so uh, well it must it must be really strange as an engineer slash producer to have a relationship with brian johnson but like grow up with the replacement for bon scott you know what i mean like you're there from the get-go not producing them but at least you know what i mean like your heart and soul is like following them i presume yeah yeah for sure yeah and brian and i are are very good friends when we're together doing a record you know on days off we we go golfing, you know, I've been down, hung out with it in this house for, you know, a weekend and that and, and off running around in his cars. And, you know, when we're together, we're, we're very good friends for sure. You're truly blessed. You're truly yeah. blessed. He's a great <laughs> guy, though. I mean, oh, I said to, I met, said to Brian many times, you know, when he's done, you know, in his musical career and wants to hang his hat up, he's got a a long career as a, as a comedian. Cause he's one of those guys that just tell joke, and and have you on the floor laughing you know he's uh he's quite the guy can we um kind of follow that trajectory and and talk about back in black and for those about to rock as a fan Mm -hmm. for you what 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 do those records mean what do they mean right now well uh you know i love highway to hell when it came out it was like wow this how can they ever beat this and then uh then they beat it with back in black i mean every song to me is perfection you know that's still uh the record you look to um when you're looking at you know where did the 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 peak happen and that that was the record for me like every song in that record is 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 amazing and and well crafted does the band like look back because there was a peak and with every band whether you're led zeppelin or elvis or like the beatles right um does it haunt a band of AC, DC stature thinking that, oh, we got to try to beat this thing. And it, obviously it's unbeatable. Mm-hmm. Does that ever come up? No, time? not at all. And I think with them, it's you know quite the opposite. They just go in and, and do what they want to do uh, and how they want to do it. I don't think they ever look back and say, oh, we got to make it like this, or we got to beat that, or we got, you know, I, what's done is done. And they're always moving forward and, and doing what they love to do. And, uh, and I know they hope the fans love it as well. Now, 
I, I mentioned, I, I love the comparison with power up to, for those about to rock, but I wore this because fans, purists like myself, love these two records. And it's when the band obviously just grabbed the production reins and, and no disrespect because I play this all the time. It was like the stock market crashed. It's like you have this peak and then these two records just, yeah, it was, it was really sad as a fan to see that. Were you a fan of Flick and Fly at all? I was a fan of everything they did. Uh, you know, some records uh, I like a couple, you know, two, three songs on and the rest are okay. And some records I like all the songs, you know, for different reasons. So, you know, I don't have a, uh, a favorite record and I don't have an unfavorite record. You know, they are all great little journeys when you throw them on. Last kind of question around this era. Did you ever meet Harry Vanda and George Young? Because they produced Blow Up Your Video before you guys kind of took the reins. Yeah. Uh, never met Harry, but, you know, I, of course, I did uh, Stiff Upper Lip with George. So, yeah, got right. to hang with George quite a lot. And uh, he was quite the guy, too. Uh, he's another one that's sorely missed. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And the ride after the Razor's Edge was just, you know what I mean? It just kept going up and up and up. What are some of your highlights from that era? Well, from that era, like, you know, every record I get to hang with the band for a few months, uh, you know, because I don't see much of them when we're not working together. So every record I get to hang with them and and every hang is always a, a great time. Um, and it's just, for me, I always have such respect for them that, you know, like everybody says they make the same record. Well, you know, they don't really, you know, they don't change their way. They don't change what works for them. And they put all their heart and soul into everything they do. So it's always very uh, uplifting working with people like that. You know, it's always, everything's always positive and, you know, we're all a big team and we're on, on it and everybody's putting in a hundred percent. So that's always great energy to be around. And, and with them also being, you know, such nice human beings uh you know it's just an experience of the lifetime working with them it's funny you mentioned that because it was one of my questions um does it do you take it personally when people say that they haven't changed their sound in decades and like you're the one that's kind of guiding the sound <laughs> you know not not really uh i know you know i know what everybody means like you know they they think acdc is like a three-chord band well you know, if you listen to their songs, there's not three chords in you know, this right. more than that. Um, but, you know, that's their sound. Like, you know, I think uh, some bands, you know, have, have great success in a direction and then they get bored with it. So they're changing it or they're trying to chase what's popular there. You know, ACDC does it because they love doing it. They're not doing it for money, fame or anything, you know, so that's kind of the difference. So, you know, they 